chase on me. No chase on me. No chase it. Saw this verdict as you saw it, and the jury has spoken. Uh, our audience has been here most of the morning waiting to see the verdict, and lots of people, as you saw, had some pretty strong reactions. Obviously, you're very happy. I'm now, very happy for his before I just blow this thing completely out of the water, I'm also very happy I want you to understand something. So I want you to understand how profitable well, it was for OJ to do here? it. I want you to understand. Happy, however. Not everyone here is happy. That it was big business. I'm talking about big business. Millions on top of millions to push this narrative of OJ doing it. She said if he ever did it, he would get away with it. That's what she said. And he, he All right, let's get into it. We will be right back. The body of 34 year old men, both had apparently been stabbed. Simpson told police he was in Chicago at the time of the killings. He arrived at the home 12 hours after the bodies were discovered. Police escorted him to the rear of the building, and a short time later, Simpson was seen in handcuffs. After a conference with Simpson's attorney, Howard Weitzman, Simpson was released from the cuffs and taken to police headquarters for questioning. Back up, please. Get out of the way. Get back here. Don't know Don't know He's obviously shocked and upset and um, just wants to do whatever we can do to find out who did this and you know, make the necessary arrests. Nicole Brown Simpson was O.J.'s second wife. Married in 1985, they were divorced in 1992, but the couple's relationship had been stormy. Simpson was fined $700 by a Los Angeles court in 1989 after pleading no contest to wife beating. Recently, however, friends say the two had discussed a reconciliation. Police will not say whether Simpson is a suspect in the killings. Larry Carroll, NBC News, Los Angeles. <laughs> For maybe about two decades, two decades plus, America was fascinated with OJ. Message. But see, they don't talk about that. And they paint this image of Nicole as this sweet, innocent soccer mom who never did any wrong. She's just a complete victim, OJ. The big bad black man, the monster. So six months before she was killed, a man came to the house to collect on a cocaine debt. Message. Now, I'm sure you've seen the documentaries. I'm sure you've seen the TV series. You know. And it was always surrounded by OJ did it. OJ did it. Because it was profitable. So, I'm sure you've heard the popular 911 call from the sweet little innocent soccer mom. I'm sure you've heard it. Oh my God, he's here. It's OJ. He's yelling, he's screaming. Do you know why OJ was yelling and screaming? Has he threatened you in any way or, or is he just harassing you? Well, he's definitely harassing you. You're going to hear him in a minute. He's about to come in again. Okay, just stay on the line. I don't want to stay on the line. He's going to beat the shit. Wait a minute, wait. Just stay on the line so we can know what's going on until the police get there, okay? Okay, Nicole? Uh-huh. Just a moment. Does he have any weapons? I don't know. Okay. He went home and now he's back. Okay. The kids are up there sleeping and I don't want anything to happen. Okay. Has he hit you today or no? No. Okay, you don't need any paramedics or anything? Uh-uh. Okay. You just want him to Close leave? My door. He broke the whole back door in. And then he left and he came back? And he came and he practically knocked my upper door's door down, but he pounded. Okay. 
Because see, they don't tell you this. They don't tell you what I'm about to tell you. Message. The reason why you hear OJ in the background yelling and screaming over the 911 call is because Nicole Simpson was in the house abusing drugs in front of her kids. She had company. She had a house full of people. Everybody using drugs and performing sexual acts while the kids were there. All in the living room, all over the place. This is why OJ was yelling. Ron, over here. Okay, one cafe Americano Grande. You do that so well. Have you ever thought of becoming a waiter? <laughs> so, um, what do you think? Are you gonna go with me to the gate on Friday? See, now I know what you're thinking. If I go on a date with you, then maybe I'll let you drive my Ferrari again. Now let's talk about Nicole Simpson, Ron Goldman, and the Mezzaluna restaurant. Have you ever heard about this Mezzaluna restaurant? Okay, this particular restaurant was heavy with mafia action. Message. Heavy mob ties. The same way Ron Goldman and Nicole Simpson were murdered, four of Nicole's friends were all murdered the exact same way. Message. The exact same way. But wait, there's more. There certainly are accounts of people involved with the Mezzaluna having been involved with what uh, one author refers to as organized vice uh, prostitution drugs. I cannot say that the Mezzaluna as an institution was involved with something like that, but there are numerous accounts that in fact people who frequented the Mezzaluna were engaged in those kinds of activities. There's absolutely no question that a Columbia-driven cocaine business had come in to Los Angeles at that time. Cocaine would come in on pallets, and there was a turf fight over who's going to distribute cocaine in Los Angeles. I was told by people who worked at a couple of these fashionable L.A. Westside restaurants like Mezzaluna that the people running them are distributing drugs, and some of the people who work here are mules. For those who don't know, a mule is a person who carries drugs from one place to the other. Ron could have been in a situation where he knew too much. One year before, Ron Goldman had an acquaintance named Brett Cantor, who was involved with a club called Dragonfly here in Los Angeles. And Brett Cantor got his throat slit from year to year. Exactly like Ron Goldman. That's it! Ron Goldman is up dead. One year after that, another young man associated with that celebrity named Michael Nick. Now, who was abusing drugs around that time? The cold system. Three young men. Who was heavy on into drugs? The cold system. All killed in unsolved crimes. We don't know what his connection to it was. What we do have very clearly is this backdrop of this drug culture, which contains convicted felons, which contains lots of money, which contains dead bodies, and nobody talks about it. Nobody has really opened this door. In January of 1994, a man came to OJ's house 
to collect on a cocaine debt. Came to OJ's house to collect on a cocaine debt. Now, who was abusing drugs around that time? Nicole Simpson. Message. Who was heavy off into drugs? Nicole Simpson. Message. Who was partying, using drugs, drinking, sleeping with everybody? Who was heavy affiliated with all the mobsters? Nicole Simpson. Message. Ron Goldman. Ron Goldman worked at the Mezzaluna restaurant. Nicole Simpson was there almost every night. That was a kick in his spot. And like I stated, multiple friends of Nicole Simpson were murdered the same way. Message. So was OJ just going around carving people up? What I think happened? Now this was nothing that I can prove. Nothing that I was able to dig up. Just my beliefs. I think it was multiple people. I think it was multiple people who killed Nicole Simpson and Ron Goldman. How did one person, just one person with a knife kill this high level martial artist and not just him but two people. Nobody ran? So he just sat there and got stabbed up, poked up, sliced up, carved up, and butchered. And the other person just sat there waiting for their turn? Man, stop it. Now let me address this whole narrative of OJ being the jealous ex. OJ went into such a rage all due to his jealousy, right? Do you know how much OJ and Nicole was swinging? I mean, swinging, 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 swanging with the A. Hard. OJ and Nicole was even swinging with the Kardashians. Message. Some say, nah, I don't know. I don't know, right? Some say, your girl Chloe, you know, OJ might be the pappy. That's what some say. I mean, when you look at the two, I don't know. Uh, she do got that. She do got that head, but I don't know. That's neither here nor there. Now, these two were into swinging heavy. So this whole narrative about OJ was in this jealous rage. Do you know Nicole was having sex with one of OJ's best friends? Marcus Allen, former football player. This is what they did. Message. And they still remain friends. So you can throw away that whole narrative of OJ being jealous because Nicole didn't want to be with him. Phone records prove that Nicole Simpson was on her phone at 11 p.m. Not only do phone records prove this, but her mother confirms that she was on the phone with her daughter at 11 p.m. Do you know where OJ was at 11 p.m.? On his way to the airport. How does O.J. kill two people, go back to the scene, as the FBI agent said, hide the clothes, hide the knife, get home, get cleaned up in five minutes? Couldn't happen. Anybody worth its salt should have seen this acquittal coming over the horizon like a Sherman tank. Message! For O.J. Simpson and his ex-wife, Nicole, the afternoon of June 12th, 1994 began with a joyous event, their daughter Sydney's dance recital. The recital began at 4.30 p.m. and lasted for 90 minutes. Father and daughter posed together, and Nicole's family and OJ shared warm embraces as they said their goodbyes following the recital. It was 6.30 p.m. The 
Brown family consisting of Nicole, Justin, Sydney, Sydney's friend Rachel Berman, Dominique and her son Aaron, Lou and Judy Brown, Denise and her son Sean, piled into two Jeep Cherokees and drove to Mezzaluna for their 645 reservation. Shortly after 8 p.m., the family said their goodbyes, and Nicole took Justin, Sydney, and Rachel Berman for ice cream at Ben and Jerry's. Nicole and the kids arrived home at 8.30 p.m. Rachel and Sydney were having a sleepover party that night. Approximately 15 minutes later, the phone rang. It was OJ calling to congratulate Sydney on a great dance performance. After speaking with her father, Sydney returned to Rachel and their sleepover party. At about 9 o'clock, there was an unexpected guest at the gate, Rachel's father, Robert Berman. The Berman's plans for June 13th had changed, and Mr. Berman arrived to pick up Rachel and take her home. According to the police report, Mr. Berman and Nicole spoke for about 15 minutes, and the Bermans departed at approximately 9.15 p.m. Back at Mezzaluna, waiter Ron Goldman had just finished his shift and was clocking out for the night. It was 9.33. Ron then joined Mezzaluna manager John DiBello at a table and the men chatted for 15 to 20 minutes. At 9.37 p.m., Judy Brown placed a call to Mezzaluna. That call was answered by Karen Crawford. Mrs. Brown explained that she had forgotten her glasses at the restaurant. Miss Crawford placed the call on hold and looked for Mrs. Brown's glasses. She found them in the street by the gutter. Upon hearing the good news, Mrs. Brown told Miss Crawford that her daughter Nicole would pick up the glasses. The testimony of the staff of Mezzaluna indicates that Ron did not eat anything while he was at the restaurant. Therefore, one must conclude that Ron ate after returning home and prior to his murder. Shortly before 10.30, Ron embarked on the five-minute drive from his apartment to Nicole's condo. LAPD detective Tom Lang discovered something important about the gate at Nicole's condo. The mechanism to release the gate remotely was broken, meaning that Nicole was required to exit her condo and manually open the gate for any visitor. At approximately 10.34, Ron rings the gate buzzer. At the same time, Nicole's neighbor, Denise Pilmack, hears a dog start to bark. Forensic evidence suggests that Nicole was attacked first and, based on the injury to her brain, was likely struck in the back of the head and thrown down to the steps. This swift attack likely incapacitated Nicole for some time. The killer or killers then engaged in a prolonged struggle with Ron Goldman. The forensic evidence establishes that this was a fierce, chaotic fight with Ron landing multiple hard punches and kicks to his assailants. Ron was stabbed 23 times but fought hard to save his own life. As Ron lay wheezing and dying with blood flowing down the left side of his body, the killer returned to Nicole. The forensic evidence suggests that Nicole fought her killer and dug her nails into the killer's body. However, the killer overpowered Nicole and butchered her neck in the most sadistic way possible. After nearly decapitating Nicole, the killer returned and plunged their knife into the heart and lungs of Ron Goldman, killing him. At OJ's estate, a limo driver was waiting to take him to the airport for a red-eye flight. Now, do you receive, do you see on the uh, phone bill in front of you, sir, a call at 10.52 and 17 seconds? Uh, yes, I do. I saw a figure come into the uh, entranceway of the house, just about where the, where the driveway starts. Can you show us on this uh, diagram where you first saw that person? Uh, just... If you go where the circle is, you go straight back, no the other way, a uh, little bit farther, it was about there. That Was that the first point at which you saw the person? Yes. And this uh, six foot, 200 pound African American person in all dark clothing, was he moving, was, it, was this person moving quickly or slowly? Not quickly, not slowly. <laughs> uh, a good pace walk, it seemed to be. And moving in what direction, sir? Into the house, or towards the house. 
How long after you saw the six foot, 200 pound uh, person in all dark clothing go into the house, did you continue to talk to Dale St. John? Well, it was just uh, anywhere between 10 to 30 seconds. It wasn't very long. And uh, it was within the last 10 to 30 seconds of that call at 1050, of, of ending that call at 1055, that you saw this six foot, 200 pound person go into the uh, entrance? Yes. Can you uh, tell us, sir, when you first pulled up to the, up into the driveway, where did you park? I parked with my driver's side window parallel with the front door of the residence. Did you notice uh, the front door area when you did that? Yes. And what, what did you see? Uh, the front door was open, and there were uh, a couple of bags on the porch. Can you tell us, sir, approximately how long it was between the time you saw the six foot, 200 pound person dressed in all dark clothing go into the house and the time you saw Mr. Simpson come out the front entrance? It was somewhere around five and six minutes. For O.J. Simpson to have been the killer of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman, in 21 minutes, he would have to do the following. Murder to adults. A prolonged struggle. The bodies of both victims show multiple defensive wounds. When Mr. Simpson was examined and photographed by LAPD on June 13, 1994, there were no bruises anywhere on his person. Travel home without getting any blood in his Bronco. There was only one-eighth of one drop of blood ever found in Mr. Simpson's Bronco, and the world's most renowned criminalists agreed that the assailants would have been covered in blood. Mr. Simpson would need to have cleaned all the blood from his body. However, there was no blood found in Mr. Simpson's plumbing, washing machine, drain traps. Where did the blood go? After showering, Mr. Simpson would have dried off using a towel. Yet no towel with any blood or dirt or debris was found at Mr. Simpson's property. In those 21 minutes, Mr. Simpson would have needed to dispose of a murder weapon, bloody clothes, a blood-stained towel, and hide them in a place that no one has ever found them. Mr. Simpson would have needed to clean any blood, debris, or dirt that he surely would have tracked into his house. Keep in mind, the carpeting leading up the stairs and throughout Mr. Simpson's entire second floor was basically white yet no dirt or debris or blood was found on any of the carpets. In less than five minutes after Alan Park saw the dark figure, Mr. Simpson was clean, showered, ready to go, jovial, well-dressed, and ready to leave for his trip. The timing is absolutely impossible. Unless O.J. Simpson could control the space-time continuum, it is impossible that he is the killer of Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson. No case that I am aware of in the history of this country has had so much DNA evidence. Football Hall of Famer O.J. Simpson is questioned in the murders of his ex-wife and a male companion. New evidence is reported this morning in the murder of former football star O.J. Simpson's ex-wife. The bodies of Nicole Simpson and a male companion were found outside her Los Angeles condominium yesterday. This morning's Los Angeles Times reports that police found a blood-soaked glove at Simpson's home, and the L.A. Daily News reports it matches a glove found at the murder scene. A police forensics team began a search of the crime scene and O.J. Simpson's home. Investigators removed several pieces of evidence from both properties. A blood-soaked glove, according to the Los Angeles Times, found at O.J. Simpson's home and believed used during the killings. A second newspaper reports the matching glove was found at the crime scene. First, let's start off with racist cop Mark Furman. Mark Furman, do you know who he is? He's one of the most racist cops in LAPD history. Message. 
Mark Furman enjoyed setting brothers up. Admitted by him. This is what he said. He enjoyed it. He has a long history of setting brothers up. After incident, that Detective Furman was willing to violate the law and the federal civil rights statute to unfairly prosecute black men who had been found in the company of white women. Furman denied those allegations, but when he took the stand, famed defense attorney F. Lee Bailey laid the trap. You say on your oath that you have not addressed any black person as a or spoken about black people as in the past 10 years, Detective Furman. That's what I'm saying, sir. But audio tapes existed of Furman using the N-word in interviews with a screenwriter who was researching a movie about cops. It's got the smell of it. been killed in there for years. We got to be patient, we shouldn't be so stupid, which I thought he was. So, just handcuffed him. couples. Mark Furman is the person who found the glove. Mark Furman. Uh, I noticed uh, the glove when I walked around to the, after I exited the residence the first time I walked around to the side or the north side, north perimeter of the uh, 875 Bundy, there's a uh, iron fence and through that iron fence, you can get very close to the male victim. And looking there, I could see them down at his feet. And looking there, I could see them down at his feet. He talked about a crashing sound on his wall at about quarter to 11. He went out to investigate that, he's telling me, and uh, he sees the limo. I stopped him right there, and I said, come, would you come with me? I'll just sit here, and somebody's going to talk to you in a minute. I immediately responded to where I thought that crashing sound uh, hit the other side of his wall. I was looking at down the walkway towards where Mr. Cato or Cato's wall was. When I got to uh, within several feet of uh, his wall and I estimated from the architecture of the buildings about where his wall would be, I looked down and I saw a dark object and as I got closer uh, I shined my flashlight on it and I could see it was a glove. When I found the glove and, and actually realized that this glove was very close uh, in description and color uh, to the glove at the crime scene, my heart started pounding. Now let's talk about the blood samples. Because I know you're probably thinking, okay, well, what about the blood? First of all, OJ's blood. Do you remember or do you even know that they lost samples of OJ's blood? Message! They couldn't find it. Several samples of OJ's blood, they just mysteriously lost. Now, what about the blood that they did have? There was tons of a chemical called EDTA found in the blood. What is EDTA? It prevents the blood from clotting. There was large amounts of EDTA in the blood. And when they spoke to the prosecution about it, they could not explain it. Nobody had an answer. Nobody had an answer why there was so much EDTA in the blood. Now, I spoke about all of the mafia business that was going on at the Mezzaluna restaurant. I spoke about how mob ties were heavy. Did you know Nicole Brown Simpson's sister 
Denise Brown was dating a mafia hitman. Now let's talk about the book. If I did it, the judgment came down on the book and the fact that the Goldmans now have 90% of it, the other 10% goes to the creditors. That was what the official <laughs> A lot of would. creditors. They got a lot of creditors. <laughs> <laughs> they only get 10%. Oh, my God. When all of this took place, OJ was broke. OJ was flat broke. So they offered OJ some serious bread. That's why he did the book. He already beat the case. Why wouldn't he do the book? You telling me you wouldn't have done that book? Legal fees and everything else surrounding this case sucked OJ dry. He got paid about four million bucks for that book deal. Why wouldn't he? Faye Resnick talked about in her book about the drug use of her and Nicole Brown Simpson. These women had all kinds of cocaine debts. And as I mentioned before, January of 1994, one of those mobsters one of the mafia cats came to the residence to collect on a cocaine debt. So, I want you to take everything into consideration that I just mentioned in this video because this is the type of stuff that never makes Hollywood. This is the type of stuff that never makes these documentaries. This stuff is never in the TV shows. These are the things that they don't tell you. Message. Now let's talk about the actual slaying. Let me say this. I'm a martial artist. I've been a martial artist for well over a decade. I've trained in several arts. From what we know, Ron Goldman was a martial artist. From what they say, a high level martial artist. Now, they claim OJ killed these two people. Just him by himself with one knife. Just OJ. OJ had no bruises. For those who know the story, you probably think, well, what about the scratch on his hand? That was probably your first reaction. Well, he had a cut on his hand. It's more like a scratch. That was already confirmed. Already confirmed that that happened in Chicago when OJ was out of town. Police, sciences, DNA, whatever you want to look up, it's already been confirmed and verified, and they've already put a stamp on it that that happened in Chicago. So, get that scratch out of the way OJ had no bruises so you mean to tell me this highly decorated martial artist didn't even put a bruise on OJ it's already confirmed that Ron Goldman had defense wounds so he was fighting back that can't be disputed there was defense wounds but OJ had no bruises, no nothing. Now this man is a highly decorated martial artist. He couldn't put a bruise on OJ. Now here's another theory. There's a man named Glenn Rogers. Glenn Rogers was responsible for over 70 deaths. 7-0. And his weapon of choice? A steak knife. Or any type of knife for that matter. Now, this man, Glenn Rogers, was following Nicole and following Faye Resnick. He began stalking these women because he planned on robbing them. About a week before Nicole's murder, Glenn called his brother on the phone 
and said, guess what? I'm at this party, and guess who's here? Nicole Simpson. She has a lot of money with her. I'm going to stick her, and I'm going to do it tonight. So this dude already had plans on killing Nicole. That's it. Now, obviously, that night Nicole wasn't killed. Glenn's own family brought forward information to the prosecution, and they ignored him. They ignored him. They denied him. This same man used to drive a white pickup truck because he was a painter, and he was doing some painting jobs in the area. Now, the day Nicole and Ron Goldman were murdered, a white pickup truck was spotted in front of their house just hours before the murder. Glenn Edward Rogers is top of the news for all the wrong reasons. Glenn Edward Rogers is wanted by Los Angeles, California for a homicide. He's wanted in Jackson, Mississippi in connection with a homicide. He's wanted in Bozier City, Louisiana for another homicide. He's left a trail of mutilated victims. Come on! Let's go! Authorities warn that Rogers is armed and very dangerous. I came to a realization I wasn't turning in my brother. I was turning in a serial killer. My brother hadn't lived there for a long time. In 1995, my brother Glenn Rogers was arrested in Kentucky, wanted for killing women across the country. Could it be my brother was really the worst serial killer America has ever seen? How many people have you killed, Mr. Rogers? Huh? How many people? Glenn Rogers is my brother. He said they haven't even scratched the surface. He said 70. He had murdered 70 women. Did you do this, Glenn? Did you kill those women, Glenn? One on one alone. At the jail, you interview me. Did you kill the women? Now, after he was arrested due to various other killings, while he was on death row, he dedicated a painting to Ron Goldman and Nicole. The painting had all kind of knives, tombstones, and it had their names on it. Now, see, while he was on death row, People started getting in his ear. People started telling him things. You know, hey man, just say OJ hired you. Just say OJ this, OJ that. So he came out and tried to say that he did it for OJ. You know, OJ kind of paid him off or whatever. Man, stop. This dude was stalking Nicole and stalking Faye Resnick way before he even mentioned OJ. <laughs> In 1994, an earthquake rocked Los Angeles. About the time the quake hit, my brother Glenn showed up in town. I was working in Los Angeles at the time. The North Ridge earthquake hit earlier that year, and I was working for a company doing earthquake damage. A few months later, Glenn risked coming back home, even though Ohio police wanted him for questioning. In 1994, Glenn was living in L.A., and he came back to Hamilton for a visit, and that's why I decided to have a cookout and have my family over. He told me that he'd met this beautiful girl out in California, and her name was Nicole, and said that he had done work for her in her house and said that they went out a couple times for drinks, and he said, you know, Sean, my daughter, and her look so much alike. And he said, she's married to this football player see he don't know much about sports and he said this football player and he's black he's famous but I don't remember his name he just remembered Nicole I'm in my mother's house at this time and they're already looking for Glenn the phone rings and I talked to him and he asked me she guess who I'm partying with 
Nicole Simpson. Uh, me, I, nobody knew who that was. I thought, well, who's that, Bart Simpson's sister? I mean, just joking. He said, no, that's when he told me that that, that was O.J. Simpson's wife. Actually, what he told me, he says, they got money, they're well off, and I'm taking her down. He called his brother and was bragging to several family members and friends, close friends, how he was partying with Nicole and how he was going to get her. Never say anything about OJ until an opportunity presented itself. Then he started throwing OJ in it. And see, Glenn's victims were women who abused drugs. He would stalk these women. Women who were constantly hanging out at night spots, like Nicole. Abused drugs, like Nicole. And women who had money, like Nicole. Like I said, the minute he met Nicole, the first day he ever saw her and was hanging out with her, he told his brother that he was about to kill her that night. Message. He was about to rob her and kill her. So where did OJ come into play with all this? It was profitable to say OJ did it. Six weeks after OJ was found not guilty, the law caught up with Glenn. It wasn't long before my brother was dropping hints about his past crimes. First time I heard about Nicole Simpson and Ron Goldman's mother. Authorities ignored clues leading to my brother, and it would be years before Glenn came back to that story. Glenn wasn't going to drop hints and letters this time. My brother had learned a new trick during his years on death row, how to paint. These are pictures that uh, Glenn Rogers actually drew in his cell uh, at various times during our correspondence. Glenn was even able to paint the demons he believes have lived inside him all his life. Glenn had explained to me the meaning of this piece. Basically, what you see here is two bottomless abysses, and this is the, the evil within him looking into the deep abyss and seeing two huge tunnels leading down into hell. At first, Glenn drew what took over his mind when crimes occurred. Then my brother started drawing hints about the blood he had shed. At this stage of our relationship, Glenn starts to include clues and or names and or places that he knows I will find in a certain amount of time. In June 2011, Glenn sent the criminal profiler a clue that linked him to the murders of Nicole Simpson and Ron Goldman. Here you see R-O-N, and on this tombstone, you see the letters N-I-C-O-L-E. His admission of his involvement in the Ronald Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson murders. Message! Glenn Rogers explained to me that he had parked his white pickup truck, a Ford pickup truck, uh, on the side street right by the side of the condo. You see, you have to take all this into consideration. So did OJ really do it? You know what? You tell me your answer in the comment section. Thanks for watching. Make sure you hit the thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe. Let me know what you think in the comment section. Please follow the History with No Chaser Facebook and Instagram page.